James, tell you some of this. There's a little bit of background uh, about me. Uh, I'm an odd person to be talking about adoption. I'm, I'm not uh, a childcare professional. I'm not a social worker. Most of my time, as you can see, has been working with offenders. I've spent 23 years working with offenders uh, in prisons. And then I, I ran the prison service in England and Wales and later the prison and the probation service. Uh, uh, moved to, to Bernardo's, complete change for me. The first non-childcare professional to uh, run Bernardo's. Uh, and then somewhat accidentally I found myself uh, advising the UK government on adoption and I'll uh, explain a little bit of that. Uh, the, uh, our Prime Minister David Cameron asked me last week to move on to take a look at uh, uh, children in residential care, which are 8,000 in England. When I arrived at Bernardo's in 2006, uh, one of the first things I was uh, given to address with the government was um, a bit of research that we had done about very poor academic outcomes for children leaving care. And I should say the first of the three presentations is really about care and neglect. Uh, which was the platform for the government determining to try to rejuvenate adoption. Uh, and I, uh, I spent quite a lot of time, it was the first big media event I did in leading Bernardo's, I spent a lot of time criticising the government for what appeared to be scandalous outcomes for children in care. Uh, in retrospect, I feel embarrassed by some of the things that I said. Uh, but at the time, at the time, they were accepted very sympathetically by the government ministers that then Secretary, Secretary of State for Education in the UK uh, commissioned me to find out what we could do to reduce the numbers of children in care. That was because care was seen as unequivocally a bad thing. Uh, the culture uh, was to try to keep as few people, to take as few children into care as possible, and care was seen a bad thing because of the very poor examination results I mentioned. Uh, the fact that, and it is the case, there's a significant proportion of those young people, young men in particular, in prison have spent some time in care, and also because of a great deal of instability of care placements, children, of which it's the, there are a significant number who move from foster placement to foster placement, or in and out of residential care, move schools a lot, and not surprisingly, their examination results are that. And also at the time, this is 2005 as I arrived at Bernardo's, Social workers, childcare professionals, particularly some children's social workers, were getting a tough time in the press. Uh, and a tough time from some politicians. They, in the UK parliamentary system, we have select committees which take an expert look at different areas of policy. Select committee chairs are very influential people. This was a man called Barry Shearman, uh, and he talked in 2005 about the perception that the care system was catastrophic for a child's prospects. And Lord Justice Wall, the most senior family court judge in England, talked, uh, as you can see here, about social workers uh, removing children uh, scandalously into an unsatisfactory care system. So when I started this piece of work for the government, while still running Bernardo's, um, I was very convinced that I could find a way of reducing the care population, find a way of discouraging social workers and local authorities from taking children into care. And I had a number of public consultations. And during the whole of that study, no one in public, in sessions like this, mm -hmm. no one ever said that they thought that the fundamental assumption I had was wrong. But time and again, after these sessions, someone would linger at the back and come up and see me and quietly tell me that I'd got it wrong. These were usually childcare professionals who were saying that they were alarmed at the circumstances in which they were leaving children and the fact that they thought they were under significant professional pressure uh, to manage neglect in the home rather than to intervene and to move children to safety. Uh, and the more I looked at that, the more nervous I became. So in the end, I disappointed the Secretary of State uh, because I made a report which said it would be dangerous to try to drive down the numbers in care. And uh, we simply had to have a policy where we liberated practitioners to make the best decision in each individual case and they should not be influenced either way. But it caused me to begin to look very, very closely at the issue of Bernardo's. 
and uh, as I've explained, I'm not a I'm not a, a social worker. I'm a parent. I'm a dad. Uh, and to some extent, I think the fact that I was a lay person might have helped a little bit. And uh, there's a rather long quote here, uh, which I won't bore you with reading out to, but you'll be able to read it yourself. But it's quite significant. Uh, I, Bernard has worked right across the four nations of the United Kingdom, and this was on a visit to Belfast in Northern Ireland. Uh, and it was a, a, a really important visit for me because I'd, I'd gone to look at work we were doing in Belfast, and we do this in, or Bernard just did this in a number of cities, to try to repatriate children, to try to get them home. And I became alarmed having heard about this particular case and these particular children and met the mum to whom Bernardus was about to recommend <coughs> get care of children again. Uh, I was alarmed by what I saw. And when I went back, this is what I wrote uh, as a record of my visit to share with uh, my uh, board of trustees. So although it was quite clear to me that our intentions in this respect, and this was a case which I later found was not untypical. Although our intentions were laudable uh, to try to unite the family, I was really worried about what we were doing and why. Uh, and I felt that what was best for the children wasn't necessarily predominant uh, in the work that we were doing here. In the same entry, I went on to say this. Uh, Part of the problem is I fear that these seem to be such illiberal, illiberal things to say, much less to write. And I left the visit seriously perturbed that staff were working in a context in, we, in which the interests of the child were not the overwhelming consideration they should be. Uh, following that, I started to uh, share some of my concerns uh, at a few conferences. and. Uh, a body called the Institute for Public Policy Research in the UK uh, asked me uh, if I would write something about the issue of care. And I wrote a short paper, uh, only a couple of thousand words, but I, I wrote a short paper arguing or well, talking about my nervousness about uh, the fact that we might not be responding as well as we should to neglect. Uh, and that was reported somewhat enthusiastically by the Daily Telegraph, a national paper in the UK, a quite right-wing paper. It didn't do my case any good at all, but they reported quite so enthusiastically uh, about, about this. Uh, but what was significant is the then government, the then Labour government, the opposition, including uh, the Conservative Party, who now form the government, or were about to form a coalition government, uh, Every children's charity, apart from my own, were united in condemnation of what I'd said, the su suggestion that we might need to have more, not fewer, children in care. Um, but slowly, the argument began to be won. And when we got a coalition government in 2010, uh, the, the Secretary of State for Education, a man called Michael Gove, uh, uh, began, much more than his predecessors before him, to have a look at the evidence. Uh, at this point, 2011, I'd uh, left Bernardo's, and uh, when I left, the London Times commissioned me to write something about adoption. And uh, uh, they got interested in a campaign for reasons of which I, I'm uh, a little bit uncertain, because like a lot of the press, they had been very antipathetic about childcare professionals and about the taking of children into care. But it was a rare opportunity for me. And a rather odd thing for a, for a national newspaper to do, I wrote a very long report of about 22,000 words and they printed every word of it as a special supplement. Uh, and that report, I'm going to talk about the first bit of that report, which was really an analysis of why we would got into a bit of a pickle about taking children into care and why the decision to take a child into care was so often uh, delayed or resisted. Uh, and I found that there were generally three main reasons for re refusing or, or delaying the decision to take a child into care. First of all, interpretations of attachment theory. Secondly, issues about parental rights influenced, particularly by Article 8 of uh, uh, the, the uh, 
uh, human right, what, what became part of the Human Rights Act in the UK, which uh, is sourced from a uh, European uh, Court of Human Rights, and a need to support parents, and I say parents, but overwhelmingly we're talking about lone mothers here. There are very few fathers around in uh, these cases. And thirdly, I believe that care made things worse. Now this is a bit I'm always nervous about in talking to a room which has some professionals because I'm not pretending to be an expert on attachment theory. But what I found is a lot of practitioners who told me why attachment theory meant it should never move a child from its mother, I found that they'd read precious little of the uh, literature. Uh, people knew a little bit about a man called Bowden who was the, very much the guru of attachment theory but hadn't read him uh, as thoroughly as they might, but uh, essentially this is what attachment theory uh, says. It talks about the necessary bond with at least one responsive parent, which promotes secure attachment, which can have, as we now know, significant consequences for later life. Having secure attachments makes children much more resilient, uh, much more psychologically and physically healthy, and they do better at school and so forth. What I found, and this, this very helpful definition is from a body called the Royal College for Pediatric, Pediatric and Child Health in the UK. What I found is that many practitioners took a leap from the acknowledgement that that's indisputably true to a belief that that meant that one could never or should do everything possible not to, to separate mother and child. But actually what the literature made very plain was that attachment theory, while pointing to the need for a living bond, uh, doesn't specify that that necessarily has to be with a birth parent. It does say that that bond is necessary, and the sooner it's achieved and the earlier in a child's life it's achieved, the better. But it doesn't suggest that it needs to be with the birth mother or the birth father. What's vital is this word, stability. But secondly, if I look at the Article 8 of the European Convention, uh, this, uh, this now has a, a very significant effect on both legislation and practice in the UK, but again, sometimes only the headline of what Article 8 says uh, has uh, dominated practice. The right to respect for private and family life and uh, the fact that public authorities should not disrupt that. But actually, Liberty, who are a, a very uh, uh, strident and very effective pressure group in the UK, have pointed out that actually uh, interference is justified uh, when uh, a child's uh, interests are in danger. And there's no question in law in the UK of balancing what's best for the child with what's best for the parents. But again, I found that in practice, if I asked practitioners what they thought they were doing in dealing with child neglect, if I asked um, local authority, child care professionals and local authority lawyers, they invariably or very frequently told me that they were trying to balance the interests of the child with the interests of the parents. The law in the UK is very, very clear. The child has absolute privacy. And although, obviously, um, one works with parents, local authorities work with parents, what should dominate is what's in the best interests for the child. But I found that very, very frequently practitioners in trying to balance those interests, however much they shouldn't have been as far as the law was concerned, were doing a great deal of work to support the parents. Uh, Jenny Hope is a, a care leaver and lecturer. Um, she's uh, written a simply fantastic and heart-moving book called Hackney Child, which I could not recommend uh, more warmly, uh, talking about her own uh, treatment in care. The fact this is a, she a quite remarkable uh, woman. She's been the most, most fantastic person to get up here at some point. She, she tells the true story of being nine year old, a nine-year-old and taking her two younger siblings into a police station and asking to be taken into care because she knew that her mother, which is she loved her, could not look after her. And uh, Jenny Hope uh, gave me this quote, all too often I hear social workers talking about adults and what is best for them. And I also found that uh, I've done quite a lot of work on social work training and made some recommendations for changing the way social workers are trained at universities uh, in the UK. 
And there's a thing called non-oppressive practice, which uh, is fundamentally uh, a good thing, but sometimes um, sees inadequate parents as victims, in which case removing a child is seen as further victimization. And again, the interest of the, of the frequently the, the mother uh, dominate the interests of the child. And actually, I can understand that because sometimes we're dealing, child care professionals are dealing with families where actually the mother deserves a great deal of sympathy. She's on her own, she has very little money, she's living in poverty, uh, she's had a very, very bad deal in life. But actually, uh, the recognition that she may not be able to care for the child is sometimes delayed and sometimes removal of the child when it eventually happens, happens much later than it should. But the third reason I found that why children were, weren't being taken to care despite the evidence, and this is perhaps the most important of the three, was just a, a passionately held belief that care would make things worse. And to what I found in this debate, about which there are passionate views, and despite the evidence I'm going to share with you, you would still find lots of people in the UK who would fundamentally disagree with me. Uh, and it's not because anybody is being maligned. People care about this passionately. I've ne met nobody in this debate. I've met nobody in the field of adoption who hasn't cared passionately about what they're doing. And the belief that care makes things worse is still something which is held by a lot of people uh, in England, including a lot of senior managers in what we call children's services. Um, Care doesn't make things worse. Uh, the, the research and the reality of the research in the UK is very, very clear about this. Uh, care needs to be improved in all sorts of ways. And the, the piece of work the Prime Minister in the UK asked me to do last week is something I'm really pleased to do because we spend, in, the, in just in England, we spend a billion pounds on residential care for about 8,000 children. Uh, and the outcomes for those children are very bad. But actually, that's much more likely to be explained by what's happened to them before coming into care. The reality is, and this is from uh, Professor Donald Forrester, who's just moved from the University of Bedfordshire to the University of Cardiff in Wales. And this is a review of all the research about what has happened to children in care uh, in England and Wales, this is. Uh, sorry, all British research since 1991. And as you can see, uh, his conclusion was that children entering care tend to have serious problems, but in general, as a consequence of being in care, their problems improved over time. And when compared to children of a very similar background who remained in what is sometimes called managed neglect, the uh, children in care, uh, things got a little bit better for them. And crucially, he concluded, it suggests that attempts to reduce the use of public care are misguided and they place more children at risk of serious harm. The research suggests contrary to passionately held beliefs makes things better. And I found, I still, with every new minister who arrives into this area, uh, I have to argue this all over again. There's, there is an entrenched belief in the UK that taking a child into care will make things worse uh, when it makes things better. And also what I found was that, and again the research is very clear on this, but the gulf between evidence and research and practice I found is much wider than it should be. Uh, what the research also shows is that historically there's been a, a great deal of, of unfounded optimism about returning children from care. And this is a, a fantastic bit of research. Professor Len Farmer is at Bristol University. Followed 138 children who had been returned from care back to the parents with all proper support from child care professionals. But despite all that, two years later, uh, three in every five, 59% were abused or neglected once again. So we started to have a shifting practice, a great deal of brave leadership from uh, the Secretary of State for whom I was advising Michael Go, and from the, uh, the then new Prime Minister David Cameron, and the informal pressure on childcare professionals not to intervene and not to take a child into care has slowly started to be lifted. And as a consequence, helped in part by the fact that we've had a couple of 
really uh, terrible cases involving the deaths of children who were left in the family home for too long, slowly the numbers in care began to rise from 59,000 in 2008 to 68,000 uh, now. So that's a, a pretty significant increase, 40% over six years. Uh, it's important to put that into a context, however, because although people will sometimes talk to me about the fact that we have uh, record numbers of children in care, actually we don't. As recently as 1981, we had 92,000 children in care, and we have 58,000 children in residential care in 1981, and the change in the population, the reduction of 58,000 children in residential care to 8,000 in that period is quite remarkable. But nevertheless, the numbers in care uh, have been uh, rising significantly. So my report for the Times argued that uh, one, if we had a, if we had to be more realistic about the fact that there were children coming to care who would have to stay in care, who were unlikely to be able to go home. And the research in the UK is again pretty clear about that. It suggests that if you can't get a child home within about six months, they're not going to go home at all. Although frequently we will we'll continue with trying to repatriate families for much longer periods than that. Uh, now crucially, I'm sometimes uh, caricatured as somebody who sees adoption as a solution uh, for every child in care. That's absurd. Uh, I've made very plain in this report, I've made very plain since then that adoption could only possibly be appropriate for a, a minority of children in care, but that it was probably appropriate for a rather larger mi minority than those who were getting it. But family re reunification must be the first priority. I was very proud of some of the work that we did at Bernardo successfully to do that, but I've warned that we have to be very, very careful about uh, the fact that sometimes we try too hard to achieve that reunification. If family reunification can't work, uh, then kinship care has got to be the next choice, and we've seen a very significant increase in kinship care through a thing called special guardianship orders uh, in England. Uh, so we've made it much easier for grandparents to care for children. We still have to do much more. Um, uh, and I've been doing some work with uh, the government to try to get, uh, quite recently, get more financial support for grandparents who are, as you know, typically about my age or a little bit older, just settling down to a life of retirement on a pension, and suddenly they're perhaps caring for a couple of teenagers again, and they're forced into uh, great financial difficulties. But I'm very clear, the first option is trying to get the family back together. The second is kinship care. But it's quite clear that after you've explored both those options, there's still a population of children left in care for whom adoption uh, would clearly be of considerable benefit to them, uh, and they weren't getting it. The reality was that I found that adoption uh, was still seen as something which was almost Victorian. Um, and many practitioners felt passionately that adoption was, in almost every circumstance, uh, represented a failure on the part of childcare professionals to make the parenting of a particular child a success. Uh, some saw this as a very class issue. Uh, a, a, a leader of uh, childcare professionals in, uh, in England, her ward name, talked uh, very disparagingly about adoption was being about giving working class children to middle class parents. And some literature on adoption has had a, a, a very significant negative influence. Nancy Berry's The Primal Wound, uh, published oddly enough by the British Association for Adoption and Fostering until recently, the primary charity dealing exclusively with adoption, and yet they published The Primal Wound. And this famous quote from Nancy Berry uh, has had a very significant influence on professionals who, no matter how well the child appears to do uh, uh, in the adoptive family, uh, is a, it is taken as granted that there will be some sort of devastating, devastating psychological loss as a result of the adoption. And needless to say, the evidence does not suggest that at all. The evidence on outcomes is very clear. The children, particularly children who were adopted early, have very, very good uh, psychological outcomes as they reach adulthood. 
Uh, there was still, at this point, uh, 2010, 2011, still a great deal of media criticism about children being taken into care without good cause. Uh, and one uh, member of parliament, uh, not a, a part of the coalition government, but a significant player nevertheless, obtained significant publicity in and out of parliament, suggesting that there were too many adoptions and that many of those adoptions would break down. And uh, because I've been at Bernardo's, although Bernardo's uh, did very, very, were involved in very few adoptions, uh, my motives in arguing uh, the need for more adoptions was seen as self-serving on the part of my previous employers. Uh, I also discovered that adoption had slipped off the radar. It had very little part in social work training. I looked at the curricula at three major universities producing graduate social workers. Two didn't mention adoption at all in their three-year degrees. One mentioned it very, very briefly in one uh, optional uh, specialty in the third year. And uh, there had been, of course, a significant shift on the part of local authorities and childcare professionals to any possibility of relinquishing a child. And I've certainly never advocated relinquishment. And in case anyone is in any doubt, let me say absolutely that I am fundamentally pro-choice as opposed as when one talks about alternatives. But uh, I don't know if Planned Parenthood in the USA get quite as much publicity here in Australia as they do in the UK. But Planned Parenthood are frequently vilified in press coverage in the UK as some sort of organisation which is uh, uh, trying to promote abortion of all, uh, all else. Actually, Planned Parenthood website in the USA is very balanced and in the advice they offer to uh, women who are pregnant and are wondering what to do about their, their pregnancy, they, they say that you can either uh, you can keep the child and we can give you some advice, we can give you support, you can decide to uh, uh, abort the pregnancy or you can relinquish the child. But relinquishment has almost completely disappeared uh, in the UK and uh, sometimes uh, uh, mothers-to-be who inquire about it from local authorities are uh, discouraged from even considering uh, that. And as a result of all this, adoption numbers have been in massive decline. There were 20,000 adoptions every year until the mid-70s. Again, if I had a pound for every politician who's told me this is because these children were all seized from single mothers, if I had a pound for every time I'd be so told that, I'd be very rich. And of course, some of them were, uh, and that's incredibly, incredibly sad. But actually, it was never the case that that was where all these adoptions came from. 22,000 adoptions in the mid 70s, and half of those children were born in marriage. Uh, but uh, from 22,000 adoptions in 74 to into 2011, when uh, I started to advise the government about adoption, the numbers had dropped to 3,000. And uh, policymakers, civil servants in the UK government were very clear that the numbers had flatlined and would not recover again. Uh, if anything, it was considered that adoption would continue to uh, disappear as a disposal for children, and uh, we would have to rely almost exclusively on fostering residential care or kinship care. Uh, so that was the challenge that we were faced, and I'm going to pause there. In the next part of this, I'll talk about what was done to try to change the system to make adoption more successful and then in my third session I'll talk about some of the really tricky issues where we have to confront practice with evidence.